Okay, so we finished off last week with the life of Jehoshaphat, but then we uh, talked about his son Jehoram, who was uh, an exceedingly wicked dude. He had all of his brothers murdered. Now, that would look really normal if we were talking about pagan kings at the time, because that's what they did. Um, but to have a king down in the southern kingdom do something like this is just shocking. And what it really is a reflection of is the fact that this son, remember at this time, Israel is divided into two. Uh, two tribes in the south, Judah and Benjamin, um, where they're is alternative, alternatively uh, uh, good kings and bad kings. It's the line of the Messiah that shows up in Matthew chapter 1 that goes right down to Jesus Christ. But in the north, in the northern kingdom, uh, which had been created during the reign of Solomon's son Rehoboam, uh, there was nothing but wicked kings all along. Well, the most wicked king in the north was a guy by the name of Ahab, and Ahab married Jezebel, and uh, 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 rather uh, Ahab and Jezebel uh, had a daughter, and that daughter married Jehoshaphat's son Jehoram, and so when you, and the whole thing with Jezebel, her dad had been a pagan priest, and so all those kind of pagan practices of these uh, of foreign kings and um, foreign pagan rulers and religion really was brought into uh, the uh, Israel through Jezebel. And, and Ahab, basically, Jezebel was the leader of the family, uh, and uh, she really was the one that, um, that really instructed her husband on uh, leading the land. It says Ahab led the whole, whole nation of Israel, speaking of the northern ten tribes, into the worship of Baals. But it was their daughter who just uh, continued uh, this, uh, continued this, uh, heritage of evil because she was married to this guy Jehoram and between his wife and his mother um, he just continues uh, the, the, the behavior which we had never seen in Israel before now we see it for the first time um, he kills all his brothers and again pagan kings used to do this in order to consolidate power but to see this right here uh, by a king who's in the line that goes to Jesus Christ is a shocking thing. And so uh, he killed all his brothers. And uh, we saw last week, winds up getting a letter from Elijah, a highly extraordinary thing. There's no such thing as the book of Elijah, like there is Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. But here we have a letter um, by Elijah rebuking the guy and prophesying to him that he is going to become really, really sick and his intestines are, are, are going to really come out of his body. So he, he dies in severe pain. It says these sobering words in verse 20. It says that he had reigned in Jerusalem eight years and to no one's sorrow departed. And verse 22, it says, then the inhabitants, is where we pick up this evening, the inhabitants of Jerusalem made Ahaziah, his youngest son, king in his place, for the raiders who came with the Arabians into the camp had killed all the older sons. So Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, reigned. And so his, again, Jehoram, this wicked man who killed all his brothers, Whenever, the Bible says in Galatians, we'll get to it eventually on Sunday morning, whatever a man sows, he will reap. And so one of the things that, that happened um, to 
this wicked man Jehoram, who killed all his brothers, is that um, Arabians had came in and killed all his sons, except this one, his youngest son Ahaziah. Verse 2, Ahaziah was 42 years old when he became king, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Athaliah, the granddaughter of Omri. Uh, and, and so uh, his mother's, uh, the, um, this woman Athaliah was Jezebel and Ahab's daughter. Her name was Ath- Athaliah. And uh, we're going to be reading a lot about her. Verse 3, he also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother advised him to do wickedly. And so um, here we read that the influence of mothers, you, you know, being a mother is a glorious calling. It's a glorious calling just to be a, uh, a mother. And she can be just an influence uh, for, for good or she can be an influence for bad. I'm in the process of trying to uh, memorize um, Ephesians chapter 5, which goes over the behavior of husbands and wives and fathers and children, but, and, but also Colossians chapter 3 does the same thing. And it's interesting, it says, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they be discouraged but it doesn't have anything any instruction towards mothers and i believe the reason for that is just mothers just they love their kids they don't even have to be instructed whether or not to love them and they do have an enormous influence um, on their children it says that he his 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 mother advised him to do wickedly. Again, this is Jezebel's daughter advising her son to do wickedly. The, 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 and, and wickedly in this context means really reigning as king for your own purpose, for your own good. God has nothing to do with it. What can you do to consolidate your power to... Um, Uh, to reign for your pleasure. His mother advised him to do wickedly. Then it says in verse 4, Therefore he did evil in the sight of the Lord, like the house of Ahab, for they were his counselors after the death of his father to his destruction. So his cousins up in the northern kingdom were his counselors. Again, to a student of the Bible, this just looks weird. What do you mean his counselors were from the house of Ahab? That's from another kingdom. Because by now there's two kingdoms. There's a kingdom in the north, and there's a kingdom in the south. And I believe this is the only reference of counselors from the, uh, from the kingdom in the north counseling a king in the south. It's a very strange reference to someone who's a student of the Bible. And I just want to ask you today, who are your counselors? Who are the people who have, you have surrounded yourself with who are your influence, the influence um, in your life? Who are your counselors? What I, what I have found for, since the advent of radio and television, and then of course later on the internet, so many in the church today are being counseled by the internet. That's their counselor. They're being counseled by social media. They're being counseled by um, just myriads of different news channels. Um, They're being counseled uh, by podcasts, by uh, TikTok, whatever. And, And... uh, a lot of it is so often times, um, even, even when people, uh, Christians are looking at videos, their video, uh, you know, with various opinions, their videos of Christians who are talking about any myriad of subjects 
who they don't even know. <laughs> and, and, but they, they, they drink in a lot of the counsel. And even, even, you know, anyone can say now they're a Christian or put the name of Jesus Christ over, over their counsel and, and speak in the name of the Lord. But does it really line up with Scripture? And the local church in many parts is weakened because people are going people in a church they're going outside the church and getting counsel from people they don't even know their lives they don't know their walk and um and it this happens but i just want to 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 ask you who are your counselors if you're spending more than half an hour this is my opinion and i'm sorry if i sound like a pharisee but if you're spending more than a half an hour uh, on, on social media or, or reading different kinds of TikTok videos or, or whatever, or just going from YouTube video to YouTube video, that, those are your counselors. I get news for you. You can even look, uh, even on, on Facebook feeds, um, oftentimes there's, there's counsel uh, just coming up from the various posts, different kind of counsel who are your counselors? Um, you need to be very, very careful who your counselors are. It says that he gathered around him counselors from the house of Ahab. Uh, and it's good for us just to do inventory as to um, who really is counseling us. I know that I have um, a circle of friends uh, and pastors who I go to for counsel, but most of all, I go to the Lord. I try to get out and pray every day and cry out and seek the Lord. <laughs> Would you please tell me what I'm supposed to do? This is too much for me, Lord. Tell me. Counsel me. Get your counsel from the Lord. What have we learned so much about the life of Jehoshaphat? What's that wonderful the four-letter words, a lot of times we hear, you know, they're bad. What's the wonderful four-letter word that we constantly saw associated with the life of Jehoshaphat? Shout it out, someone. Seek. Seek. Who said that? Who was that? Oh, very good. Wow. Seek. 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 Jehoshaphat was such a powerful, wonderful king because he sought the Lord. Jesus said, seek and you will find. Jeremiah um, it's, it's, it's funny, what, uh, what's the verse? So someone was just saying a couple days ago, uh, I, I, was, um, I was counseling a couple actually, and, and uh, one, of the, one, one of the folks I was counseling said her, her favorite verse was, is it Jeremiah 29.11? 29, so 29.11 says, I know the plans or the thoughts I have for you, plans for your prosperity, plans for, plans for your peace. And I said, well, do you know the verse that's two verses after that? And she didn't. And I said, you have to put those two together. You can't just like Jeremiah 29, 11. It's, I know, it's a lot of people's favorite verse, and I'm not knocking it. But, but if you're not, if you're, you're not implementing Jeremiah 29, 13, which says what? You will seek me and find me when you search for uh, for me with all of your heart. When you do that, you'll know what the plans of the Lord really are. Um, otherwise, you're just going to be making your own plans that sound good and say, hey God, can you, can, can you like uh, approve these plans that I made? Seeking the Lord. That's who we get our counsel from. But he's getting counsel um, from the house of Ahab. Ouch! And Ahab was just a puppet for Jezebel. Verse 5 says, He also followed their advice and went with Jehoram, the son of Ahab, king of um, Israel, to war against the Haziel, king of Syria, at Ramoth-Gilead, and the Syrians wounded Joram, or Jehoram. What was the one big mistake that Jehoshaphat, that wonderful seeking man of God, who sent out missionaries, did wonderful things, what was his one big mistake? Someone shout it out. Other than Freddie, someone shout it out. What was it? 
He wanted people to like him, and as a result, what, was, what one big mistake did he do? He went up and went to war with Ahab, so, it, it, which was disastrous. But now you see, uh, now you see his um, grandson doing the same thing. And this is a bummer, right? Because he, even righteous people, when they make mistakes, I got to tell you, there's consequences. Of it. People are still using David and Bathsheba as an excuse for their behavior 3,000 years after the fact. And, and here, he's do, his grandson of this incredibly righteous guy, his grandson, who is a wicked man, is saying, well, you know, my grandfather, he was so well-known, he was a righteous guy. He went up and fought with, aligned himself with the evil kings in the north. And he goes and he does it too. He does this um, in the north. He goes uh, and it says that Jehoram, meaning the king, Joram or Jehoram, this, both names are used, really confusing, but uh, first and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, you've got to read it like five times before you can get used to all the names. But the king, his cousin, the king of the north, uh, gets wounded, verse 6, then he returned to Jezreel to recover from the wound which he had received at Ramah when he fought against Hazel, king of um, Syria, and Azariah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to see Jehoram, the son of Ahab, in Jezreel because he was sick. His going to Jehoram was God's occasion from Ahaziah's downfall, for when he arrived, he went out with Jehoram against Jehu, the son of Nimshi, whom the Lord had anointed to cut off the house of Ahab. And it happened when Jehu was executing judgment on the house of Ahab and found the princes of Judah and the sons of Ahaziah, brothers who were, served Ahaziah, he killed them. And then he searched for Ahaziah and they caught him. He was hiding in Samaria and brought him to Jehu. When they had killed him, they buried him because they said, he is the son of Jehoshaphat who sought the Lord, here it is, see Jehoshaphat, there's that word again, sought, seek, associated with Jehoshaphat, with all his heart. So the house of Ahaziah had no one to assume power over the kingdom. So, if you haven't been with us, this may all sound a little confusing, but in... 2 Kings chapter 9, Elisha had, uh, or, or one of, Elisha, I think, it was Elisha sent a prophet to anoint this man, this general in the northern kingdom by the name of Jehu. And he basically said to this man named Jehu, because of all Ahab's wickedness, I want you, I want you to go kill um, his entire family, his entire bloodline. And so that's what winds up happening. It reappears here in, in, in chapter 22 that these two kings, one in the north, one in the south, both are related to Ahab, that wicked king, Jehu kills both of them. And so uh, there's judgment, the judgment of the, of the Lord there. It says, now when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, now remember, I know this is really hard, there's all these names, Athaliah is the daughter of Jezebel. It says that when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal heirs of the house of Judah. In other words, she went and killed all her grandsons. Again, this is Jezebel's daughter. She kills all her grandsons. And then she says, when I'm the queen. So she, in addition to everything else, she was power hungry. And this is like craziness at, at this point. And uh, it says, verse 11, but I'm going to try here to pronounce this name. Tiffany, maybe this is the name if you have a daughter. 
Jehoshabeath. Jehoshabeath. But Jehoshabeath, the daughter of the king, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being murdered and put him and his nurse in a bedroom. Talk about high drama. So Jeho- Jehoshabeath, the daughter of King Joram, the wife of Jehoiada the priest, for she was sister of Ahaziah, hid him from Athaliah so that she did not kill him. And he was hidden with them in the house of God for six years while Athaliah reigned over the land. So this is a crazy thing. This woman, Jezebel's daughter, takes over as queen. She thinks she's killed all the... uh, uh, She thinks she's killed all her grandsons. Little does she know that this woman took one of the grandsons, he's one year year old, and hid him in the temple. Hid this grandson in the temple. And she reigns for six years thinking, not knowing, that the real king is now living in the temple. So, I believe we mentioned, because this whole story, by the way, is in 2 Kings. It's the second time we've gone over it. It's kind of like the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Lord, uh, the Holy Holy Spirit, Spirit wanted us to read four different accounts of Jesus' life. For some reason, the Holy Spirit also wanted us to read two accounts of many of these things that happen with the kings, particularly in this case, really the kings of the south. They wanted us to read it twice, which is a message to you and me. we got to get this. we got to learn from these people's lives. For six years, this woman is reigning. Now, if people knew their Bible at the time, they would think that the promises of God, some of the promises of God, had failed. Why is that? Because God had promised David that through his descendants, a Messiah, who we know as Jesus, would be raised up and be the Messiah, the the Savior of Israel. They would have been looking for six years at like, whoa, what's going on here? The promise of God has failed because David's descendants have been killed by the daughter of Jezebel. And it's important for us to take note here because there's certain times in your life, in your life, where you're like, I know what that, I know what Romans 8:28 says. I know it. It says. For we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are according to his purpose. But I've been living this nightmare in my life for two years and there is no way at all I can see any good ever, ever, or as he said up here, ever, ever becoming good for me for any purpose. We've got to remember the promises of God do not fail. What does Paul say in 2 Corinthians? That every promise of God is yes and amen. We have to remember the promises of God. To say, I, 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 I'm sure there were people uh, who knew the word of God at this time. There were still righteous people in the land. Keep in mind, Jehoshaphat, a great revival had happened. There, there were, were people who knew the word of God, and they're like, I don't get it. There's supposed to be a descendant of David. Who's going to lead to the Messiah one day? All the descendants are dead. I, I don't understand this, but I, I have to believe in the promises of God. I need to continue walking with God. And, and let me tell you, everyone, every single one of you in this room who are following Jesus Christ, you'll be in a place in your life where you're thinking, it makes no sense how any good can become of this, but I'm just going to keep on walking, believing the promises of God.
First Peter 5 is another important promise. In First Peter 5, it says this, God, and this is a promise actually that's in several places, but God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that God may exalt you in due time. A lot of times you get into a job or something like that and you're not being recognized for what you're doing or you may even be transferred to a job that's like even more, it seems like a downgrade, but you're just humbling yourself and you're looking at people who you think may be incompetent or they're, or, or, or they're dishonest or they're deceitful or they're, they're just the, the people at work who are always complaining, they're being exalted. And you're like, what, what about that verse in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6? The humble, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due, due time. That, that is not happening to me. Do you just wait? <laughs> you just wait. You just continue walking with God. He will exalt you in due time. He will. And there were people at this time, there were certainly people at this time thinking, what's up with that? Little did they know that there was a little boy growing up in the temple, and Athaliah, the, the, this queen, this murderous woman, she could care less about the temple. She was not hanging out at the temple. She was a pagan ruler. So let's see what happened. In chapter 23, in the seventh year, Jehoiada strengthened himself. So who is Jehoiada? Jehoiada is the high priest, and he was a righteous man. God always has a remnant. He always has people living for him. He knew about, he knew about this boy that had been taken into the temple when he was one year old. And the se- so this high priest, Jehoiada, he's a superstar in the Old Testament. Don't hear a lot about him. But man, we need to learn from his life. Jehoiada strengthened himself and made a covenant with the captains of the hundreds. Azariah, son of Jeho- Je- 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 Jeroham, Ishmael, the son of Jehohanan, Azariah, the son of Obed, Messiah, probably pronouncing that right, the son, uh, wrong, the son of a- Adiah, and Elishaphat, the son of Zikri. The Bible is a history book. This is, these aren't fables. It's actually people, flesh and blood. Verse 2, And they went throughout Judah and gathered the Levites from all the cities of Judah and the chief fathers of Israel, and they came to Jerusalem. Remember the Levites? That's one tribe, the um, of the 12 tribes of Jacob, 12 tribes of Israel, and they were the workers in the, uh, the, workers in the temple and the teachers of the law. Verse 3, Then all the assembly made a covenant with the king in the house of God. So they, they're making a, a covenant with a, a seven-year-old boy at this time. He, he has a, what's called a regent. The Jehoiada, the high priest, is basically the one who is in charge of, uh, of the king. And it says, He said to them, Behold, the king's son shall reign as the Lord had said of the sons of David. So there it is. There's the promise. Says, Everyone thought that the sons of David, um, the, the Messiah is going is to come up through them. You guys probably thought that wasn't going to happen. Well, here is the son right here. He's been hidden, hidden here in this temple. Verse 4, this is what you shall do. One third of you entering on the Sabbath of the priests and the Levites shall be keeping watch over the doors. One third shall be at the king's house and one third at the gate of the foundation. All the people shall be in the courts of the house of the Lord. But let no one come into the house of the Lord except the priests and those of the Levites who serve. They may go in, for they are holy. But all the people shall keep the watch of the Lord. And all the Levites shall surround the king. 
Remember the king, seven years old at this point. On all sides, every man with his weapon in his hand, and whoever comes into the house, let him be put to death. You are to be with the king when he comes in and when he goes out. So the Levites and all Judah did according to all that Jehoiada the priest commanded, and each man took his men who were to be on duty on the Sabbath with those who were going off duty on the Sabbath, for Jehoiada the priest had not dis- dismissed the provisions and dismissed the divisions. And Jehoiada the priest gave to the cabins of the hundred the spears and the large and small shields which had belonged to King David that were in the temple of God. Then he set all the people, every man with his weapon in his hand, from the right side of the temple to the left side of the temple, along the altar and by the temple, all around the king. And they brought out the king's son, put the crown on him, gave him the testimony, and made him king. Then Jehoiada and his sons anointed him and said, Long live the king. And they said it really, really loud. I can't help myself. I love, in verse 11, I know things get really exciting in verse 12. But before we go there, it says they, they gave him the testimony. They gave him the testimony. What was that? That's the book of the law. They gave this little seven-year-old kid, they put a book or scrolls or whatever form it was. They gave him the law. And I, I just, I just, I just love Deuteronomy 17. It's the, it's the rule for kings. And one of the rule for kings is when they take over the th- uh, throne, they were given a book and then they had to write for themselves a copy of the law in a book before the priests and the Levites. Now, the seven-year-old probably couldn't do this yet. But what a wonderful tradition to require the king to write the entire book of Moses. But that's what this is referring to here when it says they gave, the, verse 11, they gave the king the testimony, meaning the law, the book of Moses, and they made him king. And then they shouted out, long live uh, the king. And they did it really loud because verse 12 says, now when Athaliah, as Jezebel's daughter heard the noise of the people running and praising the king. She came to the people in the temple of the Lord. And when she looked, there was the king standing by his pillar at the entrance. And the leaders and the trumpeters were by the king. And all the people of the land were rejoicing and blowing trumpets, also the singers with musical instruments, and those who were led in praise. So Athaliah tore her clothes and said, Treason, treason. Now that's a weird thing, isn't it? I mean, this woman who like hacked to death all the heirs of the throne, she's crying treason, treason? You gotta be kidding me. Verse 14, and Jehoiada the priest brought out the captains of hundreds who were set over the army and said to them, take her outside under guard, slay her with the sword, and slay with the sword whoever follows her. For the priest had said, do not kill her in the house of the Lord. So they seized her and she went by way of the entrance of the horse's gate into the king's house and they killed her there. Then Jehoiada, remember, this is the high priest. This is the one who had been taking care of this kid, the king, for for six years. He made a covenant between himself, the people, and the king that they should be the Lord's people. So the, 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 the people, they had experienced what it was like to just live under wickedness. They made a covenant. Yes, we will be the Lord's people. We will do that. In a sense, every time we gather for worship, we were worshiping today before the service. 
We're just renewing a covenant. We're your people, Lord, and we love you. It's hard to pay attention during worship sometimes. Especially for me, I'm coming in, I'm the pastor, especially on Sunday morning, there's all these different issues happening. I'm trying to worship. The Lord is constantly just rebuking me. Would you worship me? Would you stop? Don't care about that light that's off over there or don't care about, you know, whatever the sounds, to, <laughs> the, the sound guy. And worship. So important. It's a form of just renewing our love for the Lord. Of course, we can do that every day, but it, here they do it as a people. Verse 17, and all the people went to the temple of Baal, tore it down, broke it in pieces, its altars and image, and killed Madden, the priest of Baal, before the altars. And Jehoiada appointed the oversight of the house of the Lord to the hand of the priests, the Levites, whom David had assigned in the house of the Lord, to offer the burnt offerings of the, of the Lord, as it is written in the laws of Moses, with rejoicing and with singing, as it was established by David. And he set the gatekeepers at the gates of the house of the Lord, so that no one who was in any way unclean should enter. Then he took the captains of the hundreds, the nobles, the governors of the people, and all the people of the land, and brought the king down from the house of the Lord. And they went through the upper gate to the king's house and set the king on the throne of the kingdom. So all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was quiet, for they had slain Athaliah with the sword. Chapter 24. When Joash, Joash is the new king, he was seven years old when he became king, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zibia of Beersheba. That's way down in the south of Judah. Joash did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. So remember, you have this real courageous, awesome high priest. Not all the high priests, by the way, were great and awesome. Some were wicked themselves. But he was a righteous man. and He, he was the guardian. And it says that Joash did what was right all the days of Jehoiada the priest. Now we are going to see when Jehoiada dies, Joash the king is going to basically do a permanent backslide. So while Jehoiada was alive, the, the, Joash went to him, took counsel from him. Good things happened with, in, in the land. Good things happened. The Israel, Israel pro, prospered. But what we're going to see is when the high priest died, he basically starts taking counsel from his friends. And we've seen this before. We saw it from... Rehoboam starts taking counsel from his friends, and his friends, they just want a party. They just want power. They just, you know, and he's going to go downhill. And eventually he's going to get so bad he's going to command the son of Jehoiada, the man who saved him, Jehoiada, he's going to command the son of Je um, Jehoiada to be put to death. <clears throat> I remember when I first started walking with the Lord, I, I was in church, and every time I had a Bible question, I, I used to go to this guy in the church. His name was Ron. I'd say, hey, Ron, like, I don't get this about the Bible. You know, what's the answer? And at some point, the Lord spoke to my heart. You know, nothing wrong with asking a question from time to time, but you yourself have to start reading the Bible and figure these things out. You can't be relying on someone else. 
Is there a person in your life who has such influence over your life that it's, it's, it's more than just someone who um, iron sharpens iron? You guys have heard of that proverb, right? Christians, iron sharpens iron. We both grow, you know, we grow with each other by sharpening each other. But it's not iron sharpens iron. It's just like codependency. You are codependent on someone else and their spirituality. Is there someone in your life who you're basically codependent on spiritually? And the Lord's been telling you, no, you, ha- you need to get on your own feet. You need to seek me on your own. You can't be like dependent on, on, on others. I, I, um, and one of the most tragic things is when a pastor dies or worse, falls into serious sin. There's a certain percentage of people from the church that he pastors that they themselves go off into sin. It's not going to happen, but what if, what, what if I go into sin? What if, what if Freddie goes into sin? That's not going to happen either. But what if that happened? And all of a sudden I'm gone. Are you guys going to follow? And just do your own thing? If you do, it, it says something about your own faith the own shallowness of where you're at. It says he followed, Joash followed the Lord as long as Jehoiada the high priest was alive. So important. It's, it's, it's great and wonderful to have, to surround ourselves by godly people, but we can't be codependent on them, meaning If they're not around, we're just going to go into decline. And we're going to see that now in the life, we're going to see that in this chapter, in the life of Joash. He starts off well, and it's probably, this is at the advice of, or Jehoiada Jehoiada was um, involved in giving him advice, but verse 4 says, that now it happened after this that Joash set his heart on repairing the house of the Lord. So, so, so the church had gone into disrepair, always does. When, when churches um, go into disrepair, like in Boston, they, they've turned into condos or they've been ripped down. This always says something about the spiritual condition of the land. And so we've been called to come in and repair the house of the Lord here at Calvary Chapel of the City and other, other churches around the city and church plants. But it was in ruins. And he set his heart to repair the house of the Lord. Verse 5, Then he gathered the priests and the Levites and said to them, Go out to the cities of Judah and gather from all people money to repair the house of your God from year to year and see that you do it quickly. However, the Levites did not do it quickly. And some people think that the Levites didn't go out. Remember, the Levites are the temple workers that, that, that wait, if we go out and get money from the people to repair the temple, where's the money going to come from to support us? Some people think that that's the reason they didn't go out quickly. So, verse 6, the king called Jehoiada, remember he's the good high priest, and said to him, why have you not required the Levites to bring in from Judah and from Jerusalem the collection according to the commandment of Moses, the servant of the Lord, and of the assembly of Israel for the tabernacle of the witness. Meaning, uh, we're trying to repair, we're trying to do a good thing here. We're trying to uh, repair the temple. Why is that? Why are your folks dragging their feet? Verse 7, for the sons of Athaliah, that wicked woman, had broken into the house of God and had presented all the dedicated things of the house of the, of the Lord of the Baals, meaning the temple was run down, they had taken the, the, the instruments of the temple, had been taken away, had been stolen. Verse 8, then at the king's command they made a chest and set it outside the gate of the house of the Lord. 
And they made a proclamation throughout Judah and Jerusalem to bring to the Lord the collection that, the, that Moses, the servant of God, had imposed on Israel in the wilderness. This is probably a reference to when they first built the tabernacle and Moses said, hey, if you want to participate in this, come and give free will offerings to the Lord, meaning not required, but free will offerings. And eventually they had to say, stop, you guys are bringing too much. We, we don't know what we're going to do with it all. Verse 10, then all the leaders and all the people rejoiced, brought their contributions and put them into the chest until all had given. So I don't know what the significance of this is. When Joash said to the Levites, go out throughout all the land and get, and, 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 and get money from them to rebuild the the temple, that, like, didn't happen. But when he said, okay, people, come, you come to Jerusalem to give your contribution, that worked. And it says the people did it actually with rejoicing. Verse 11, so it was at the time when the chest was brought to the king's official by the hand of the Levites, and when they saw that there was much money, that the king's scribes and the high priest's officers came and emptied the chest and took it and returned it to its place. Thus they did day by day and gathered money in abundance. Then the king of Jehoiada gave it to those who did the work of the service of the house of the Lord. They hired masons and carpenters to repair the house of the Lord and also those who worked in iron and bronze to restore the house of the Lord. So the workmen labored and the work was completed by them. They restored the house of God to its original condition and reinforced it. It must have been discouraging the people of God during that reign of Athaliah where it's just being ignored, the church is being run down. But, the, but uh, again, wait on the Lord. Just wait on Him. He will rebuild the church. The, ch the gates of hell will not be uh, prevail against the church. Verse uh, 14, when they had finished, they brought the rest of the money before the king of Jehoiada. They made from it articles for the house of the Lord, articles for serving and offering, spoons and vessels of gold and silver, and they offered burnt offerings in the house of the Lord continually all the days of Jehoiada. But Jehoiada grew old and was full of days, and he died. He was 130 years old when he died. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings because he had done good in Israel, both toward God and his house. Now after the death of Jehoiada, the leaders of Judah came and bowed down to the king, and the king listened to them. Now this is not a good thing. This is very similar to what happened to Solomon's son Rehoboam, where basically his counselors were his drinking buddies or something similar to that. Verse 18, Therefore they left the house of the Lord of their fathers and served wooden images and idols, and wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem because of their trespass. Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them back to the Lord, and they testified against them, but they would not listen. God is so faithful. He's so faithful. He loves his people. We talked about last week, Elijah. He was representing the prophets on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. Moses was there representing the law. He was the prophet heavyweight. But he was, except for one tiny exception where he ministered to an evil king in Judah, he was dedicated his whole life to like evil kings in the north. In the natural, his ministry was a 100% failure, Elijah. But it shows the faithfulness of God towards his people. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 defines what love is. And it's a long definition. I don't know, it's like, it was probably about Oh, about 15 different adjectives or some, things like that describing what love is? Anyone remember what the very first thing that, is, that defines love is? In 1 Corinthians 13, shout it out. Suffers. suffers long. God, rather love, suffers 
long. God's love for you suffers long, meaning he suffers a long time when you ignore him, when you rebel, when you do your own thing. He suffers. He suffers a long time. Love suffers long. And here he is. It's like it, you read stuff like this, it's almost weird. It's like if they've rebelled so much, why are you sending them prophets to bring them back? Just nuke them. That's what I would do. That's why I'm not God. Thank God for that, for sure. But um, uh, uh, it, 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 he, he sends prophets. Verse 20, this is just one of the most outrageous uh, couple of verses in the whole Bible. The Spirit of of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, who stood above the people and said to them, thus says, God, thus says God, why do you transgress the commandment of the Lord so that you cannot prosper? Because you have forsaken the Lord, he has also forsaken you. So they conspired against him, and at the command of the king, they stoned him with stones. Say what? This is, this is the guy, Ze uh, Zechariah, his father saved the king from being murdered. Now the father's son is being ordered by that same king who had been rescued to kill his son? That's what happens. We all have the capacity for this kind of evil, the Bible says. That's why we should seek him. It's so important to seek the Lord every, every day. Seek him, Lord. Search me, examine me, see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me on the way everlasting because this is crazy. The king, at the command of the king, they stoned this guy with stones. His father again had saved the king in the court of the house of the Lord. Thus Joash the king did not remember the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done to him, but killed his son. And as he died, he said, the Lord look on it and repay. So it happened in the spring of the year that the army of Syria came up against him and they came to Judah and Jerusalem and destroyed all the leaders of the people from among the people and sent all their spoil to the king of Damascus. Meaning, whatsoever a man sows, he reaps. And then look at this, verse 24. For the army of the Syrians came with a small company, meaning not a lot of people, a small company of men, but the Lord delivered it, delivered a very great army into their hand because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers, so they executed judgment against Joash. You can't win a battle. There's a proverb that says there's no, wind, there's no wisdom, no insight, no plan that will succeed against the Lord. Here they get together a large army to defeat the enemy. But by this time, they're fighting God. And so God just uses a small company of men to defeat them. So they executed judgment against Joash. Verse 25. And when they had withdrawn from him, for they left him severely wounded, his own servants conspired against him because of the blood of the sons of Jehoiada the priest and killed him on his bed. So he died, and they buried him in the city of David, but they did not bury him in the tombs of the kings. These are the ones who conspired against him, Zabad the son of Shemiath, the Ammonitus, and Jehozabad, the son of Shimrith, the Moabitess. Now concerning his sons and the many oracles about him and the repairing of the house of God, indeed they are written in the annals of the books of the kings. Then Amaziah, his son, reigned in his place. So there you have it, that the... Uh, 
high drama that happens just in the lives of the, uh, of the kings, so much, to, so much to learn, so much to learn from them. 